Honey, I need your help with something. Pause the game and come and help me. Mom, I cannot pause this thing. Come and help me. Ah, the familiar feeling when you try for the millionth time to explain to your relatives or others that certain games are not possible to pause. Are you afraid you will leave your team hanging? Or would you get reported for being away from keyboard? I know that frustration far too well, and so I'm always on the hunt for something which I can play when I have maybe only like 20 minutes, either because I'm in a hurry or I'm dead ass tired after a long day at work and having to deal with other things. So if you have similar dilemma, I can add to it by having you decide between these two fun titles. Now for the first time I need to mention that both games are in early access, as usually I have more of a problem where one game is fully released while the other is still being worked on or is in the early access. But this means that both titles are subject to change as more content balancing and other features can be later added yet to the two games and they will still provide even more content eventually. But the question is, when will that happen? So until then, I guess we have to work with what we have access to. Story. Both games don't have much when it comes to the story, however, Death Must Die tells a story where death itself breaks the rules and starts to kill people before they are meant to die, breaking the balance between life and death and upsetting the balance of the world. And so the other gods start to collect the champions as they bend the rules of time even to try and defeat death itself. This sets the heroes in a loop where they keep battling the forces of death empowered by the blessings of the gods, each time getting randomized support which always leads to an interesting and a unique experience. What is important to note are also the devlogs as currently the game is undergoing work on the second chapter, so eventually we will get more story. Our hourglass has brought you back. Step into the water once more, hero. We cannot follow you, but soon others will come to your aid. Death will stand trial for his transgressions. Deep Rock Galactic Survivor, on the other hand, does something which Ubisoft should take a note of as it takes an existing IP and flips it on its head, creating a totally unique and new experience for those who don't have a lot of time to look for Nitro. And of course, I'm referring to Skull and Bones, which is a terrible take on Assassin's Creed 1 feature and they try to make a game out of it. Deep Rock Galactic Survivor, however, creates a brand new experience for you, the players, within the already pre-established universe, giving you a brand new game style and game loop which will pull you in, as you do not need to play this with others, you don't need that much time to take care of it, and, well, of course, there's not that much of a story, as I mentioned, we really do not have a lot of it, primarily because it just shows how dwarves are extremely resilient, and either if it's the mines of Moria or some future where they mine some sort of galactic asteroid, they try to go for the rarest resources and turn them into whatever their engineering minds can put the use into. The simplest take on the story is corporate greed sending its employees into dangerous conditions for those rare few materials. And so we should talk about other heroes and classes that are currently accessible. Death Must Die offers you five classes. Avron Knight, Krond Barbarian, Maris Sorceress, Nixie Assassin, Skadi Warrior. Deep Rock Galactic offers you only four. Scout, Gunner, Driller, Engineer. Obviously, Death Must Die offers you more classes, so they have the upper hand. What you also need to keep in mind, however, is that in both titles, you are not given all these classes right from the get-go. 
the longer you stick with the game and more you challenge yourself, the more you will be able to unlock. What I also have to mention is that while you are at the hub, your heroes can interact with one another in Death Must Die. The conversations are usually really small and it seems like you're more bothering the other hero or they're trying to find out something and you refuse to say something about your past or being really vague but uh, yeah it, it genuinely looks like if you would take the fallout special skill tree and you would put only one point into intelligence or charisma as the conversation really never goes anywhere on the other hand, what makes the dwarves in Deep Rock Galactic so special is the fact that they are given a voice. So, you get a lot of cheesy one-liners. It's almost as if you were watching some sort of 80s action movie, and instead of having to listen to... Or... You're getting too old for this shit. When we get some rare boost or level up, the dwarf says he rarely picks that one because it's a rare upgrade and it's carried over from the original game so a lot of charm about the dwarves making you want to keep them alive just a little longer to hear them spout out all these sort of one-liners is really entertaining death must die creates variations for your heroes with the various blessings they can unlock more challenges you complete or more bosses you get and different challenges you unlock like in case of Kron, you can increase your overall HP by 222 points, but all the healing is blocked, so you have to survive until the end creates a unique challenge on every run. Deep Rock Galactic, on the other hand, uses already existing mechanics of unlocking the gear of the classes that they have access to in the base game. Different loadout, different possibilities that might help you get over some challenge you are struggling to deal with. So instead of a shotgun, your dwarf starts with a pistol. Or you get the gunner class with the heavy duty cannon which shoots rockets like projectiles, making you think you are ultramarine with a bolt gun. And over time, as you play more and more, you will start to unlock bonuses to help you overcome these struggles. Leveling up and becoming deadlier. So this is a little bit more complex, yet somehow almost identical for both titles, as in both cases, you try to survive in an arena while you collect shards from the fallen enemies, which grant you experience points. The more you level up, the deadlier you become. But what gear and loadout you have and how you stack up the passive effects is what will truly carry you to the finish line. Death Must Die utilizes mechanics from ARPGs and other hack and slash games like Diablo, Hades, Path of Exile, where the experience you invest during the playthrough goes directly into randomized powers or blessings from the gods, giving you unique power-ups which help you deal with the waves of enemies. On the other hand, Deep Rock Galactic actually takes the experience to help you boost the performance of your weapons. So higher damage output, faster reload, special effects, and so on. On top of it, as you will be slaying the minions of death itself, they will be dropping random loot most of the time, not even for your class, but if you come across the right ones, or you sell enough of the ones you do not need, you will be able to buy and equip helmets, armor pieces, and everything else you will need to deck out your character in order to increase its overall stats, like spell damage, life regeneration, and so on and such. On top of it, if you defeat the Vampire Lord, you unlock this shard which allows you to boost the enemy stats like number of projectiles they shoot or area of effect, and in return you can get better items to help you make you more powerful faster. Deep Rock Galactic Survivor utilizes already established means of upgrading your dwarf as instead of relying on some helmet, you harvest rare gems and minerals, and if you ever played Deep Rock Galactic, these names might sound familiar. Bismore, Kroppa, Enor Pearl, Jadis, Magnetite, Euromite. These six are spread across the arenas, and upon you completing or failing a dive, they are added to your overall stash. 
These are then used to specifically boost stats of all the dwarves for your next run. From armor to faster movement, faster reload, experience gain, or even luck, so that you roll better upgrades during your dive while leveling up your dwarf, making you one lucky, well-armored, fast-reloading dwarf. But here is where Deep Rock Galactic does something even more interesting. As you see, the resources I mentioned are great, but they are more useful for your lobby in between dives. As during the dive itself, you as a dwarf need to find two resources which help you even more, specifically gold and nitro. These two resources are used not only for passive effects, like depending on how much gold you have, you can have increased damage output, but especially as the dives are separated into multiple stages or arenas, so you do not feel like you are running around the same place. Between each stage, you can use gold and nitra to get extra stats, and depending on of course, how much you have already invested with the minerals and which class you took to mine and extract these resources between each arena, you can find yourself greatly increasing your chances of success or survival. The fun thing is that the loot box are introduced from the base game as well, as your dwarf will make all sorts of jokes about how they should not be eating all those shiny rocks, so it's just you mining the deposits and also slaying these little buggers who crawl around while massive swarms of enemy are chasing after you in order to help you level up. This is where Deep Rock Galactic takes a slight edge or win if you will with the variety of minerals and resources which will keep you contemplating and hesitating between mining resources that will keep you alive longer on the next dive while you are being chased by a swarm of glyphid praetorians and exploders which are breathing down your neck as you are trying to dig through some rock in order to escape from the horde. Also, it's important to mention that both games use color while leveling up to show up indications of rarity or power levels from basic to average to mastery class. Both use different patterns, but this will allow you to sometimes do the stupid thing I do, like not reading what power up it does or what are you taking, you're just taking what is most rare, which will in the long term possibly not even help your run or build, but hey, it's me, I'm, I'm who I am, you are probably more proficient at these types of games, so just keep that in mind. There is also one more resource which is easier to pay attention to in Death Must Die, and that is money. Some of the enemies you kill drop small amounts of golden coins, and also will be able to sell off the trinkets and gear that you will not want to keep. This gives you much better overview of how much money you can possibly make or have, as the merchant will then even sell you back some gear which you might be interested for when it comes to one of the other classes or the class which you took out just now. Deep Rock Galactic does not do any of this, and so you're usually bottlenecked when it comes to leveling up as you need both cash and minerals combined, but I have not been able to determine what affects how much cash you end up a mission with. Does it depend on the successful dive, the amount of side missions and resources you extract? I'm not sure, however, I can at least sell resources I have in abundance for cash and then try to buy those that I might need or at least have the cash from selling the resources to level up other perk to help with the overall stats because I have the resources but I'm lacking in cash. And because of this we need to talk about the arena and the environment as it's tied to the leveling up as well. Death Must Die gives you what feels like one massive arena where you try to move from point A to point B so you can find shrines that can either increase your stats or give you power ups or possibly heal you or reward you with gold. Old. The variety is truly great, but this means that you will need to remember which ones to interact at which point, as unfortunately the ones that look like the old school wells where you manually have to crank up the bucket down and up to get your water, heal 
kills you and you can interact with it even while at full HP. Meaning you just wasted a heal that could have been used when you were actually really low on HP. The variety is really nice here and the arena never feels like it ends. This vast open space which looks like a dead forest of some sort or maybe potential remains of some structure due to the pillars that appear every now and then really gives this sort of gloom setting of death lurking around. The only limit in movement is when the bosses or swarms are introduced in which case the sort of black firewall prevents you from leaving this sort of kill zone set up for you until you slay enough forces or defeat the boss. Deep Rock Galactic on the other hand grants you the player three different biomes, each comes with different hazards or obstacles for you to deal with. Crystal caverns are your introduction to the environment. Not that many hazards, just a maze of tunnels and chambers for you to explore and dig through to find those goodies. Magma Core, place where lava is literally floor and you and the Glyphids try to walk around or avoid the melted rock in order to avoid taking damage. Hollow Bog, a strange environment where these red vines were impenetrable walls in the rock while these different types of vines grow around closing in tight spaces even capturing glyphids from running after you but also unfortunately closing off paths which you created before forcing you to find alternate Let's ways of escaping the never-ending horde. Deep Rock Galactic also gives each map three big hazards that you try to obtain or fulfill in order to get more points to unlock additional maps which are even more dangerous environments within the three currently available biomes. As each one gives you access to five different dives with higher and higher swarm rates and danger factors. Deep Rock Galactic definitely wins here thanks to the variation, changing the environment and keeping things interesting by also giving you possible side objectives to even further help you level up or get you in trouble. From my experience I usually try to focus on these at the start to try and complete them as soon as possible as the longer you drag these out the more swarm is on the map and the lesser your chance of completing the objective. Specifically they are rotated between these three options. Harvesting either 6 Apoka Blooms, 12 or dozen Bolo Caps, or in those rare occasions, more kite, which is also one of the resources qualified as primary or secondary in the main game. And because we all have preferences and not all classes are gonna be fun for everyone, the beauty of both games is that you can take one specific class and try to gather resources or loot for the other classes. I, for example, in Death Must Die like to play as the Knight or Barbarian, but I do not enjoy the Assassin class as much. So what I can do is take Krond, gather potential Assassin gear and equip it to Nixie so that she can become more deadly. In Deep Rock Galactic, on the other hand, I can have an objective or the agenda or hazard that I need to achieve so I get access to different dives and I will need to take a specific class for that task. While on the other hand, I use the minor class to go to the already finished dives where I primarily try to focus on getting my hands on as many Anor Pearls because they are a bitch to mine with pickaxe and miner can harvest them real quickly giving me the time to also run away and find the next deposit. The variety in the classes and the way you could approach the challenges you face is what truly makes both games fun as in both cases you form a team of champions that were selected for a very specific job and by cooperating they get you to the finish line. And because you don't have time or enough people on Facebook or whatever you kids use these days to stay in touch and for raiding parties, you present these teams solo and when you have the limited time for a run, that is truly the main selling points of these two titles, where you as a one player can take on the role of multiple characters to help them achieve the same goal. And of course, since we are talking about the environment, we have to mention the enemy. 
Both games utilize what you would expect from the respective universes. They do not throw in anything unusual, but they do keep things interesting by throwing in these random swarms or hordes that you have to put up with. Death Must Die does this with less of a visual indicator, it just shows you a timer and if you play the game enough, you know around what time the green slimes, the blue slimes, shields, skeletal swarm and other bosses will appear. On top of it, as I mentioned before, you will be in this kill zone more than enough and the evil forces will try to take you out. This means that if you keep an eye on the timer and manage to make it to at least some sort of shrine that can give you temporary blessing to increase your overall stats, it can usually help you. And also what I've noticed is that around the 4 minute mark you get the green slimes, 12 minute mark blue slimes, 14 minute mark gives you the necromancer and so on and such. The truly unique thing about this game is that especially at the start, if you are struggling to close in the distance to the necromancer for example, and then the black flames disappear and he keeps harassing you, if you do not dispose of him eventually, another boss can appear and you will have to deal with both of them, heavily reducing your chances of survival or successful run. Deep Rock Galactic gives you nice visual aid as to what happens during each stage of the dive as you get one supply drop and two swarms that almost completely cover your screen depending on how deep and far you got yourself. Eventually ending the first four stages with a bigger boss you have to kill. Here I came across an exploit where I usually try to preserve the drop pod for the final boss of the level and when I'm being chased by it, I guide it to the drop zone, letting the drop pod land and kill the boss from the impact. I do not know if this will eventually be phased out or somehow changed, but it is a tactic I can rely on quite heavily. Also an important thing to note is that you have multiple points of failure you can run into during each dive as once you manage to kill the boss, even going all the way down and battling it out with the final creature, you have 30 seconds to make it to the drop pod. If you fail to get inside by the end of the time, you are left behind and you have failed the mission having to return to the lobby and do it all over again. This means that you can finish on the second floor or the fourth floor or heck even on the first floor, meaning you need to prioritize those side objectives like harvesting flowers or getting more kite and once the timer starts running, so should you. Builds. Now, as every good RPG player will know, having a dedicated build is what helps you achieve your goals. I still believe Skyrim was one of the best examples of how practicing what you want to level up gets you there, but here I have to admit I'm not well versed in the art of crafting my own builds that I can recommend. I can tell you right now that in Death Must Die relying on Lightning God and God of Time is really something which you should do, but uh, that's as far as I can probably go. Deep Rock Galactic, on the other hand, I don't have specific builds because the weapons which you have or the loadouts which you can switch to are actually interesting because, for example, you can have your scout be equipped with the turrets and then you switch to a primary weapon, but as you level up and get your additional three weapons, one of those three weapons can be that turret which you actually did not choose as your primary weapon. So there you have the opportunity to mess around quite a lot with these varieties. But really the reason why playing these games and figuring it out on your own is a lot of fun is the undisputed fact that the game truly captivates you and you want to spend more time with it. My approach is that I usually try my own build first and then when the game has a potential, I try to do a specific build which I know I would enjoy. This is where channels like Fudge Muppet and Otter come to mind, but as the two titles are still undergoing work and builds might be changed or gods might be altered or things might move around, the things which work now might no longer work in a couple of months, so you have to keep that in mind. So yeah, you can look up builds, the articles and videos are sometimes more difficult to follow, I must admit, but if you want to just blow off some steam and have some fun, either one of the two titles will be a great time for you. 
combat. So this one is interesting because logically, when you have different classes and loadouts, you approach it with different playstyle, as you will not try to put someone like a wizard or a mage who can be glass cannon into a tank position where he would have to soak in the damage for someone else. I know it sounds almost as if I was still touching on the builds, but one thing when it comes to combat I need to mention for both games, and that is that in Death Must Die, you are given two options of combat, where you can press Q to queue up your attacks, and your chosen hero will start slashing, shooting, or stabbing, or whatever ballet Kron performs when he spins his arms around. Why is this important? Well, Death Must Die takes a feature from the OG first Diablo game where your attacks slow you down in a place, but also they can stun or interrupt or stagger if you want to use the gaming lingo, the enemy. This means because you are in control, you get to choose which direction to attack or which path to clear out or whom to focus on. And getting to the enemy, you can interrupt their attacks long enough to kill them. Granted, this does not work on the process, but when you get surrounded by the slimes or skeletons and they want to all attack you at once, you can either dodge it if you consider the cooldown which you have available, or you can attack them, stopping them and therefore giving yourself some breathing room as you think about what you will do next, as in Death Must Die, it's your reflexes that will help carry you to the finish line. Deep Rock Galactic, on the other hand, removes this control completely off your hands. Hell, I even looked this up and there is no way to give yourself control, which is hilarious because Deep Rock Galactic is all about you preserving your ammunition for when it's really needed as Nitro is harvested in order to let you call in the supply pod so you and your raiding party can rearm yourself with additional ammunition. Here your dwarf turns air into bullets as depending on the class or loadout as you end up having four weapons all together at the end of your run when you eventually reach level 25. This means that you need to control the dwarf with WASD and that's all the controls that you have. You cannot even control where the grenade is thrown and if it explodes near the exploder glyphid causing a chain reaction. You don't even know how many times I had the situation where the damn grenade slipped off some cliff and fell into nothingness where it detonated, not helping me at all. It almost looks like your dwarf was having too many beers at the station and now is all clumsy and drops the grenades at the dumbest spots. This is how Survivor adds challenge to the game, as if you would be able to shoot where you want to shoot, or place turrets where you would want to place them, I think you would have significantly easier time and certain weapons would have to be removed or completely reworked, as for example, shotgun will shoot only in front of you, flamethrower will spin around the round baby like a record, and one pistol will shoot only behind you. So when it comes to this, I would give the point to Death Must Die because you have the two options and allowing yourself to be in control will definitely help you, the player, to progress as the games are challenging and grindy, but if you play them just every now and then, they will still have that fun factor and that's all that games are meant to do entertain you during those rare occasions where you have time for yourself. Future content. Here's where speculations and following devlogs are important things, as if you are new to RPGs or horde modes, you just might not have the time or energy to follow everything. I get it, heck, I don't have the time to do it myself. But having at least some knowledge from my time in Deep Rock Galactic, I know that there are still worlds and biomes that can be added, like not having oxygen and being forced to keep returning to some spot to recharge your oxygen tank. You can do egg hunts, salvage operations, all these things can be implemented even for a single player experience. Other missions like on-site refining, escort duty and missions of nature like that where more players would be needed.
needed, I do not think are going to make it to the final game, just because they are more multiplayer oriented, and I do not think the games will try to go for co-op mode, as the reason they exist is to challenge or flip the already existing game, giving you unique experience at your own time and leisure. Graphics. Death Must Die shows that people respond to variety and even as if a callback to the older times where a single graphics card did not occupy half of your PC case or require you to sell off a kidney because the prices of the RTX series is just still ridiculous. The 8 to 16 bit graphics still managed to beautifully capture the details and show off the various enemies and heroes, plus their abilities. The game looks amazing, almost like a pre-built of Hades if you would uh, give the developer lesser budget for the graphics or design but it's still offering you a unique video game experience and a lot of these games which try to recreate the older graphics as if to capture the nostalgia make the game really pop and look really beautiful. Deep Rock Galactic is more polished, there are more details, the models are 3D not 2D but still have a diagonal down view which very closely follows the designs and graphics of its other title in the same universe that it's set in. Both games look beautiful and showcase that it's not necessary with every title to ask if your computer can run Crisis. Audio. Death Must Die has a nice soundtrack, but unfortunately to me it sounds like it's one extended mix on a constant loop. You will be primarily paying attention to the sound cues of the enemy swings and your own abilities as the screen will be slowly filling up with lightning, fire and all sorts of spells and projectiles. Deep Rock Galactic has also some ambience music, but as the dwarves will close in and all the explosions and firing of weapons will start to cover up the music, one special thing which is also in the base game is the sound of the dwarf from the headquarters who keeps telling you about the supply drops, the swarm incoming, the fact that the supply drop is in the middle of the bubble which you need to clear out with a cursing variant or without. There are announcements about him buying the next round when you return and as mentioned before the cheesy one-liners which make the dwarves that much more goofy and fun to keep alive. Hardware requirement. Death Must Die wins here as you really can use older potato or have even older operating software installed. 2 core processor or 4 gigs of RAM should cover you. Just keep in mind, this will result in choppy experience. Deep Rock requires your 4 basic cores and 8 gigs of RAMs when it comes to the recommended system and only mentions the 64-bit operating processor when it comes to the further requirements. So they're not really that specific, but the great thing is that these games will make a laptop huff and puff, but they will not blow its lid off. Price. Ah, yes, the eternal dilemma of every gamer. Should I pay the bills? Should I buy this game? Well, at the time of me making this, it will be possible that the spring sale has already been released because everything takes forever for me to get done due to my day job, my family, other BS that I have to put up with as I don't have or do this as my main source of income so I don't have the necessary time so I do apologize. But what you need to keep in mind is that Death Must Die comes in at 689 euros which is around 750 US dollars. Currently, there is a 10% discount on Steam during the spring sale and it ends on 21st of March, so you can buy it for 620. Deep Rock Galactic comes in at 999 euros or 1090 US dollars. During the actual spring sale, there is no discount happening, but uh, it's possible that future sales will offer further developments or changes to the prices as the games are fully released, have more content, or potential uh, discounts can be applied, so please keep that in mind. And since we're covering the games, we have to talk about bugs. To my shock, I did not come across any major bugs or crashes in either one of the two titles. This means that you are looking at solid experience in both titles as they currently are set up. 
That is really good, as lately, whenever I played something in early access, there was usually some jank I came across. However, when you look up a box for the two titles, you will definitely see that there were bugs implemented, but as the games undergo regular updates, they actually tend to fix these, so in my runs or in my experience with the games, I never came across any of what I saw so on the internet, so for me, quickly. I give thumbs up to both of the titles in their current state. Verdict. Usually when I do the comparison, it's different as for the first time ever, I'm comparing both titles in early access, which can mean that months from publishing this, most of some of the information might be outdated. I honestly think when compiling the data as both games have same loop just with different stages of it where you are released to the arena as you try to kill everything that moves and anything that is dropped you pick up to bring it to your area where you can sell it or exchange it for some other loot to help your party up. Both games have potential to grow and offer more story levels or arenas to fight it out in. My objective opinion is that if you are more serious about ARPGs and like tougher challenges, Death Must Die will be more appealing for you as the game truly rewards those who Lazy. understand scaling of abilities and utilizing builds and abilities to become the hero that the hordes should be running away from instead of running towards. Deep Rock Galactic gives off more of a goofy casual vibe with more rewards and more humor leading to more casual and hilarious experience, where you are far less likely to rage quit. Both games are great fun and have amazing potential, and who knows, maybe one day I will be able to revisit the two when they are fully released. But what do you think? Did I get things correct or wrong? Did I go into too much detail, or did I skip certain things completely? Was I comparing apples to apples, or apples to pineapples? Also, check out the channel for other content like 100 Days and Video Games and God knows what else that I put in there in order to make the channel more appealing. But most of all, let me know how many times it took you to take out the vampire in Death Must Die because so far I was only able to get him with two of the heroes and I'm also a little bit disappointed that there's no ranger or some sort of class like that in Death Must Die and they have so many melee attack classes specifically in that game.